We've been taught that thick, mossy forests have always blanketed the Northwest, that our natural state is one of verdant green. The idea goes that if we want to protect species like spotted owl, we need to keep forests like these unchanged at all costs. But what if that's wrong? What if regular fire and patchwork forests are the natural state of things, at least in many areas? The trekking poles are helping my old man bones. Ecologists Paul Hesberg and Bill Gaines have worked together for years. They're taking us on a tour through a section of the Washington Cascades that was burned by the tripod fire in 2006. Today, it's blanketed by smoke from nearby fires again. I'm not seeing a lot of uh, woodpecker cavity activity in here. I haven't seen a cavity yeah. all morning or heard any banging. The reason we're looking for woodpeckers is that they are a poster animal for how scientists like Bill and Paul are reimagining wildfire. Instead of seeing fire as a negative thing that needs to be suppressed, they are finding it is essential to the well-being of many plants and animals. For example, these burned forests may look barren to us, but for wood-eating insects and their predators, they are a feast waiting to happen. You know, one thing we don't really know is there's got to be like some woodpecker hotline where they're like, come on, everybody, there's a lot of food. Let's get together and eat. And so in flock a succession of woodpeckers and other birds. Some, like the Lewis's woodpecker, are considered fire dependent because burned trees provide one of the few habitats they can flourish in. It is boom and bust for the woodpecker. That abundant food resource is a, is a fairly short term prospect for them. It's a 10-year max. And they are far from alone, from aspen to morels, from bluebirds to black bears. There's an incredible range of plants and animals that seek out or grow best in areas touched by fire. In this tripod area, we can't go five feet without running into one of fire's biggest beneficiaries, the lodgepole pine. Oh, check it out right here. Oh, yeah, here. So, these are serotonous cones, which provided the seed for this stand, a lodgepole pine here. And so every cone scale is held together by a drop of resin. And it takes the heat of a fire to melt that resin and cause those cone scales to open up during a fire and just after a fire. And so you end up seeing lodgepole regeneration happening really fast. And these young lodgepole stands that erupt after fire are one of the only hunting grounds for one of the country's most adorable and threatened predators. Okay, so we're going to pretend we're a cat. We're going to pretend we're a Canada lynx. And what we want to find is our prize food, the snowshoe hare, about two to four pounds of nutritious meal. You can see here a scat from a snowshoe hare, so we know they've been here. Tells us this is good habitat for snowshoe hare and good habitat for lynx. That's because the hares hide in the young tree's dense branches and feed on the bark and the needles. Meanwhile, the lynx rear their kittens in mature forests nearby, but come here to hunt, both in the summer and the winter. So one of the ways lynx will hunt is if there's a hare up ahead of them, then they're going to put the sneak on until they get close enough to where they can pounce and get hold of that animal. These young pines are just big enough to provide shelter for the bunnies, but not so big that their branches no longer touch the ground. They're like a Goldilocks zone, but one that disappears as the trees grow. As Bill and Paul explain it, few animals have evolved to live in thick, unchanging forests. Instead, like the snowshoe hare and the lynx, most animals need an evolving, clumpy mosaic of landscapes to meet all their needs. And the main driver behind that constant process of change and renewal? Fire. So if you were to roll the film back 100, 150 years in history and take a look at a big landscape panorama, what you would see is places that were burned yesterday, places that were burned five years ago, 10 years ago. And so you'd see emerging age classes going on that create this variety of habitats. But decades of fire suppression have transformed that landscape. In today's situation, if you look at these big panoramic landscapes, what you see is an incredibly lower level of diversity 
where the forest has all grown up and blended, there are some critters still making a living in that landscape, but it has nowhere near the variety of the former landscape before it was homogenized. Today's thick forests, combined with a warming climate, also set the stage for megafires. The result is two starkly contrasting landscapes and a dynamic far different from the one native animals evolved with. The loss of that varied habitat for creatures like the Canada lynx has been devastating. Lynx recovery is either made or, or not here in this part of Washington. This is the, the largest population in the lower 48 states. Fire on the landscape gets really interesting when it begins to interact with what we consider fire's opposite, water. Areas like this meadows area are highly sub-irrigated, so there's water very close to the surface and in the landscapes being dewatered as the forest grows up. Encroaching trees act like giant wooden straws that dry up the meadows, so regular patchy fires help meadows stay wet. Fire also stimulates the growth of shrubs, turning wetland meadows like this one with its beaver pond into four-star dining rooms for all sorts of creatures. On our way back to camp, we interrupted one of the biggest while he was eating dinner. And so think about this movable feast where fires are always happening. Meadows are going on and offline all the time. And so the moose are moving from place to place with that fire ecology. The lack of hunting and the more fire across this landscape, restoring those wetlands, they're kind of interacting and we're seeing more moose in more areas across the state of Washington. Fire doesn't just stop these meadow buffets from going dry. Seemingly against all logic, wildfire can make whole river systems flow stronger and cooler. But for this part of the story, we're going to have to leave Paul and Bill behind and head to Northern California. So we're looking pretty much at the mouth of the Salmon River, going down the Klamath River corridor, down towards the Orleans Valley area. And you see this regional haze of the smoke happening from those fires in farther north to Northwest California, Southwest Oregon right now. Frank Lake's newest research shows that this smoke acts like a giant reflector, bouncing back solar radiation to cool both the air and the water beneath it. And it could not come at a better time for the salmon that give the Salmon River its name. The implications of that is that, particularly right now during the summer, no rainfall period, um, drought, heat wave, is that the river temperatures are increasing. The salmon particularly are really at, at stressful levels that are lethal, and the few degrees of cooling from the smoke can be that life or death situation for many of those fish. So not only is fire needed by many animals, smoke also can be a boon. Frank's research into the dance between fire, smoke, and salmon draws from his cultural teachings with the Klamath Basin's indigenous tribes, the Karuk and the Yurok. When we look at the function of smoke, many times you see in the media it's perceived as being detrimental, human health, air quality issues. But from a tribal perspective, a smoke is an essential part of the natural process. The tribes have a perspective that fire is medicine. Okay. Uh, we got sections here. This first section is going to be a big test burn. Okay. Burn it going out this way, burn it going out this way, and uh, see how that goes. Bill Tripp is one of the tribal members in charge of reintroducing fire to the land. Fire plays a lot of roles around the survival of salmon and how that's ingrained in ceremony. Historically, that those burns were an annual occurrence. They were essentially outlawed in 1911. We as Cuttick people believe that those are religious freedoms. Uh, we still have the ceremonies. Uh, we just haven't been able to light the fire that gives our prayer meaning for all, over 100 years. But now a partnership between the Karuk tribe, government agencies, and local organizations is on the front lines of implementing new policies that allow prescribed cultural burns. Bill's colleague Chuk Chuk Hillman says the salmon will also be helped by using fire to thin out the area's overgrown forests to their more open historic patchwork. Lately I've been calling it a genocide forest because you see most of these fir trees that are in high densities because even during droughts, dug firs continue to suck and they're big water hogs. And so that's another part of fire. When you're keeping fire, you don't have the densities of dug fir sucking up the water table. 
Regular low-intensity fire also helps create small landslides, and that debris replenishes salmon habitat. So there are a lot of connections that are just starting to be researched in depth, but have been well-founded in ceremonial practice. No one is advocating that we let all fires burn freely, especially the human-caused ones. But a strong consensus is emerging that, as crazy as it sounds, we need to restore regular fire to the land to help our fellow plants and animals survive. <laughs>